Hi, and welcome to my review of the newly updated Model X20. This is the flagship acoustic guitar from Emerald Guitars in Ireland. And my goal today is to make the review that I would want if I were shopping for one of these. So I'm going to do a really deep dive on all the features and design elements of this guitar and how I use them. And then we're going to do a playing section. But I don't like it when guitars are played in isolation, so I'm going to bring in two other guitars as reference. These two guitars. On my left I have a Martin D28 from the early 70s that has like 40 years of hard professional playing on it, so it's about as seasoned as a guitar can get. This is a Minty Fresh Presentation Series Taylor, a PS16CE that's barely been played at all. <laughs> so it'll be interesting to compare with these two to try to have reference points as you listen to the X20. I'll put a timestamp in the description below if you want to jump to the sound section. I'm also going to do an appendix at the end of the video about how I change strings with the new pinless bridge on the X20. So if you're interested in that, you can skip to that as well. So let's get started. If you're new to carbon fiber guitars, let's talk briefly about why carbon fiber. There are three basic reasons. One, it's impervious to humidity and really tough. Two, you can make it really pretty. And three, you can create design features that haven't been possible with traditionally built wooden guitars. So for the first, if you live in a high or low humidity area and you have a nice guitar, you may keep it in its case to keep it humidified, which means you probably don't play it as much as you wish you did. Or maybe you're humidifying a room or your whole house and dealing with humidifiers or dehumidifiers, and it's, it's a nuisance. Uh, you can forget about all of that. You can just hang this right on the wall or put it on the stand and play it all the time. They're also very tough. I once left a guitar in my car, in my trunk, on over 100 degree days for five days. I forgot it was in there. And it was fine because it was carbon fiber. If it had been a wooden guitar, it would have been in pieces at the end of that. I don't necessarily recommend that. There are limits. They're not indestructible, but they're a lot tougher than wood. You see the veneer on the front of this. I was able to go in and hand select from dozens of different incredibly exotic pieces of wood to find this veneer that suited me and felt like my guitar. And it was a great process and I'm so excited about how it came out. When they're done with this, the veneer is less than a third of a millimeter thick. It's barely there, but once you infuse it with resin, you get these incredible colors. We'll talk more about that later. For the third point, you can create a lot of design features in this guitar, which you've never been able to enjoy before in guitar building, and it makes all the difference in the world. And I'm very excited about those. So let's start with talking about the design of the body. Okay, I'm gonna use this Cole Clark Angel 2 because it's similar in size to the X20 as a comparison guitar so we can talk about the body contours that Emerald has introduced on the X20. You might assume because these guitars are similar in size that they would feel similar on the lap when you're holding them. But once you get used to the contours of an Emerald X20 body, you start to notice that traditionally built wood guitars have all these 90 degree angles from the front to the side and the side to the back, which create all these sharp ridges. And so when you're holding it, your forearm is sitting on a ridge, and some guitars have a bevel there to soften that. But the bottom, this smooth surface, isn't what contacts your leg, because nobody plays a guitar like this. You tip it back and turn it, and then the weight of both your arms pushes that sharp ridge into your leg. This sharp ridge back here gets pulled into your ribs, again with the weight of your arms. And if people have been doing this for 50 or 100 years, sure. And do we really notice it? No, it's not like they're razor blades. But when you take them away, it's really nice. Okay, a quick cutaway to just talk about the specific contours they changed. Um, the arm bevel is fairly standard. The rib bevel is just a softening of the ridge back here. But it's the bottom that's really cool. So, you know, nobody plays a guitar like this, even though that's how they're shaped. You tilt it toward yourself and rotate it. And so what Emerald did is take the bottom and they made it a contour to fit in this position, as though you took a guitar and melted it onto your leg. So the bottom is all flat, there's no ridge, which is really cool. So it's done both rotated and turned. And it's a little hard to see in this cutaway, but that's what's going on. It's, it's a two plane change and it's a really cool design element and feels great on your leg. Let's compare how I look when I'm holding this guitar, holding a nice G chord versus this guitar. Look at the angle of my right arm as it goes back and forth. See how much my elbow comes down? The guitars are the same size overall, but it fits a lot smaller because of all those accommodations. Think about a 90 degree angle. If you round it over, two things happen. One, it's not sharp anymore. But two, look how much space is taken up by that sharp edge. And if you round it down, suddenly you can get a lot closer to the structure without changing its overall dimensions at all. So when you do that here, here, and here, 
the guitar fits a lot smaller, even though it hasn't really changed size at all. Let's do one more size comparison. G chord with this guitar to a G chord with this guitar. Now obviously the Strat wins on size, but let's look at all three of them real quick. We've got the standard acoustic, look at my arm, we cut to the, the X20, and then we cut to the Strat. One more time, standard guitar, X20, and we're back to the Strat. So the X20 fits about halfway in size between an acoustic guitar of its same size and a Stratocaster. Ah, oh, that's just amazing. They think about electric guitars. I mean, they're designed for comfort, right? All these bevels and to be a size that you find comfortable. When they first came out, they were considered an outrage and they looked funny. It didn't look like a proper guitar. But it was just guys taking new technology to create a new instrument that had advantages over its predecessors. Likewise, some people don't like the look of X20s because they're progressive. They don't like the sound hole off to the side. It doesn't look like a proper guitar. But of course it doesn't because it's departing from all the constraints that have beleaguered standard acoustic guitar construction for generations to do something completely new and completely amazing. So let's talk about one of my favorite features, which is the sound hole. I have a lot to say about the design of the sound hole. It's almost silly to call it a sound hole because so many of the advantages are practical ones, but the sound part is amazing too. So let's talk about that first. Uh, the acoustics of any instrument are incredibly complex, so take what I say here with a grain of salt. But imagine a drum head, and the middle part moves the most, right? And so it moves the most air and creates the biggest pressure waves in air, and that's what sound is. So if you cut a big hole out of the middle of that, don't you think you're giving up some important real estate for creating sound? Now it's armchair physics, but I assume the same thing applies on a guitar. So if you move that hole over to the side, you're preserving all the space to make sound. Seems sensible to me anyway. Um, a lot of the base of a guitar comes out of the sound hole. And so in a traditional design, it's aimed forward. And if you're performing, that's great. But we do a lot of practicing and playing by ourselves. And so you miss out on a lot of the rich timbre of your guitar because it's being projected away from you. With this design, it's projected in a fan, so both up and out, so your audience can hear it, but so can you. And there's an intimacy to playing this instrument that's unlike anything else, and people on the forums rave about it, because now all the richness and timbre of your own guitar, you get to hear it, you're flooded with it, and it's amazing. I'm gonna do an experiment later where I microphone both in front of the guitars and up by the ear, and we'll see if we can hear the differences. I haven't done it yet, so we'll see. So that's the sound aspects of the sound hole. Let's talk about the practical aspects. There are four practical advantages to the side hole that I absolutely love. The first of them is, have you ever been playing with a pick and you fumbled your pick and dropped it into the sound hole? And now you're doing one of these, trying to shake it out of there to get it over the bracing and the battery compartment. Well, that's a thing in the past now, because it's up here. Um, if, you do, if you do somehow fling your pick up in the air and it falls into the hole, you can just reach in there and grab it. And that's unrealistic, of course. But if you need to deal with batteries or the ball ends of your strings or wires or you do drop something in there, you can just grab it. And I have pretty big hands. I don't have very fat forearms, but I have no trouble reaching in there. So that's a really nice feature. Um, the third feature is having a tuner right here. It's so easy to be able to turn it on, tune. Nobody else can even see it, but you can. You just have to look right down and turn it off again. The factory will install one for you. Um, I do it myself. I use a little Daddario tuner, the kind that ratchet clasps onto the headstock. I throw the clasp away. I saw off the peg with a coping saw, sand it down a little bit. I take two neodymium disc magnets and I glue one to the tuner, one to the inside of the guitar. Make sure the polarities are matched if you do this so they actually clip together. Um, and then you can just take it off for battery changes. But you have a really rigid, solid mechanical connection for um, sound transmission, so it picks up really well. Having a tuner in the sound hole means you don't have one of these clip-on tuners somewhere. They can get knocked off or fall off or interfere with putting it on a hanger or putting it in your case. And I just, I always hated that. And so this is a huge advantage. I love this feature. And the last feature is a little silly, but I put a, a pick holder right here. And, you know, if you are playing, it's not going to go in the hole, so it'll fall on the floor. And so if you drop a pick, you can just reach in and grab another one. And this, you know, it can be a really useful feature. So those are the reasons I love the sound hole for practical reasons, and I, I really love it. I'm such a fan of this design for those four reasons on top of the intimacy you get acoustically. It's, it's a wonderful design. So um, let me tell you a little bit about my capo mod. I'm a big fan of these G7th capos. It's two fingers on, two fingers off. You can squeeze it to whatever tension you want, move it around until it's just right. The question is, what do you do between use? 
And so I like to squeeze it on the side of the headstock because it's awkward to come over the top. But you need the right headstock shape. An emerald headstock shape is right for that, but there's not a whole lot of room over here. And there's chiseling on the bottom and it's polished. So it's easy to have a not a very good grip. So what I do is take some dual lock, that heavy duty Velcro stuff, and I cut out a piece that's matched to the back of the headstock there. And it gives it enough grip that it's a much more secure attachment. So that's just my little mod if you like those capos. This is a really cool guitar neck, and they've done some great upgrades in the last version of the X20. 24 frets, you can play up super high. Stainless steel frets, super durable. They've introduced the swirl as a standard feature at the bottom of the fretboard, and I'm really glad they did because when it was a straight line, it felt kind of stark against the curviness of the rest of the body. There's a kind of graphite looking texture to the fretboard now. It used to be high polish and it sparkles. It has kind of a cat eye effect, which matches the sparkle of the back and sides and the carbon fiber weave. It's very really pretty. I like it a lot. There's a dual action truss rod, so you can tweak the action if you want to. It came up set up just perfect for me from the factory. Um, I like the headstock and the strings go straight to the pins. You know, flared headstocks look kind of cool, but when the string has to make a bend through the nut, that just doesn't seem like very sound design to me. But speaking of design, the coolest thing about this neck is that it's now heelless. It doesn't have the, the block that a standard acoustic guitar has. And so these high frets, you can actually reach them. You can get way up here and play these high notes if you're a solo player. And so the question is, how do they do this? Because isn't that block there for strength? Well, it's really interesting. And the first question you might ask is, is there a block inside? But there's nothing. It's all just thin wall. And the answer is that because part of the reason is carbon fiber is tough. But the other reason is look at this sort of T-junction here. It's supported both across the neck at whatever fret this is down here at 20 something. And then it comes up the side where it meets at the, the typical 14th fret. And so because it's supported in two directions, it gives it a lot of mechanical stability that it can do. It's sort of like an I-beam is very strong without being bulky. It's the same basic design principle, and it's brilliant. And so you get a lighter guitar, you get a higher fret access because you can reach in there, and there's just no reason for that extra bulk. So it's a, it's a great design. Uh, one more way in which Emerald really shines in progressive design, taking advantage of carbon fiber over wood. One more little thing about the heelless design. When they had a heel here, it made it really difficult to wrap the carbon fiber between the neck and the body junction, and so you'd often get folds and wrinkles in this area, and people would comment on it once in a while. Now that the heel is gone, this wrap is super even, and that's not an issue anymore. So just one more nice little advantage. Let's talk about this gorgeous piece of koa that's infused into the front of my guitar. Now, the carbon fiber on its own is really beautiful. So if you choose to get a non-veneer model, you'll be amazed how the light sparkles in this thing. The little fiber ends glitter like gemstones, and there's a lot of motion in the carbon fiber weave itself. I will say that it looks a little darker in indoor light than it does in the professional photos, um, but once the sunbeam hits it, it's really beautiful. If you do decide to get a veneer, it's really fun. You go back and forth with the team and they keep sending you new pictures of all these crazy woods. And I recommend that you wait until you find the one that just calls out to you and says, this is your guitar. Because that's what makes it so special is when you find that piece, that becomes your guitar, a signature piece. It's like finding your favorite piece of music. You know, you didn't write it, you didn't make it, but you identify with it, and it sort of represents who you are. Um, and I had a lot of fun. I went for months until I found this piece, uh, and I love this. I think this guitar is so beautiful. I'm sure you'll agree. Um, so it's interesting that it's on the front, right? Because most guitars have this exotic wood on the back, uh, which can be beautiful, but at the end of the day, it's on the back of the guitar, and nobody really sees it. You don't even see it because it's you know, up against your body when you play it. So it's another way in which Emerald is doing really progressive design. With high-end wood guitars, you choose tone woods for the top, and they're usually relatively featureless. You can use more exotic woods for the back and sides, but then you can't see them. In a carbon fiber guitar, the acoustics are a completely different animal. So if you want to use the artwork of Mother Nature and have an individualized guitar, put it on the front where you can see it. Sometimes people ask whether the veneer makes a sound difference in the guitar. I had two X30 models, the jumbos, one with the veneer and one without. And I played them every which way, fingers and strums and picking and everything, trying to hear a difference. I could never hear a difference. I asked friends, we did all these experiments and nobody could ever tell, even blinded. The veneer starts out 0.6 millimeters thin. And by the time they fused it in, polished it and sanded it down, it's 0.3 millimeters thick. 
Now that's thinner than one sheet of carbon fiber, and there are a bunch of sheets of carbon fiber all around this guitar. So I just believe that your mind sees the wood and thinks of it as wood, but it's molecules thin. I really don't think it makes any difference. At least I've never been able to find one. On that note, let's talk a little more about what's going on under the hood and how these things are really built. How do you take carbon fiber, which is a misnomer, it's sheets of soft carbon fiber fused with epoxy resin, so it's very dense, and make a guitar that sounds as good or better than a guitar made out of wood, which is a low density organic material made of xylem and phloem, has a bunch of water in it and air and so on, and they're completely different materials. Well, it turns out there's a lot more going on under the hood here than you might think. They didn't just take carbon fiber and build a body and see what happens. There are different materials between each layer of carbon fiber, meshed work materials, that allow them to tune the density and flexibility of the walls of this guitar to create a very specific tone. So what you're hearing is the result of a lot of careful acoustic engineering. I think that's really cool. The top of a wood guitar is a flat piece of wood with purfling along the edge, where there's a hard stop glue joint so the vibrations move to the edge and bounce back for the most part. There's no hard stop on this guitar. There are, there are angles, but it's a continuous piece of material, so the vibration pattern is going to be different throughout the body. And I really wonder, for different people holding it against their bodies in different contexts, if there will be a difference in the sound. I don't know for sure, but it would be interesting to experiment with. The inside of the neck is a low-density foam, and then they wrap the carbon around that, so that's what's going on in there. We didn't talk about the bridge yet, they had a bridge with an asymmetric flare to it, which looked cool, but when you had a wood veneer with a center line, they kind of conflicted, so I'm glad they went symmetric on that. They've introduced a pinless bridge, and I've done an appendix at the end of this video showing how I change these strings. It's a little bit tricky if you're not used to it, so I'll show you what I do. So I think that about sums up the material of this guitar. Um, next I'm going to play for you, and we'll talk about that here in just a second. Okay, I've harped on this in other videos, but I really don't like using YouTube to decide how a guitar sounds. Especially with nice guitars, there's so many subtleties of tone and timbre, little nuances that let you decide if you like it or not, and small differences can have a huge impact on how you feel when you're playing the guitar. So what's the likelihood that those nuances will be authentically communicated through my microphones, your speakers or headphones, YouTube's algorithm? You know, it's questionable at best. Not to mention the fact that if you go shopping for a guitar one day, go back three days later and play it again, it's not unusual for it to sound like a completely different guitar to you. So there's a lot of subjectivity in how guitars sound. So I don't like the idea in general, but what good is a guitar review if you don't play the guitars? So that's why I'm gonna play with my Martin and my Taylor. We're gonna do ABC, ABC, little bits of each song, so you can really try to keep one in your head as you listen to the others. Um, I'm restringing each guitar with fresh Santa Cruz Guitar Company Light Parabolics. I'm using Dunlop Ultex 0.9 Sharp Picks when I play with a pick. Um, my own fingers when I finger pick. I'm far from a professional guitarist, but I'm going to do my best to give you a sampling of strumming, flat picking, and finger picking so you can, you know, make your own judgments about how this guitar sounds. So, um, with that, let's go ahead and start playing.
All right, I know this is a really long guitar review. Uh, if you're still with me, thanks for hanging in there. Um, I'm still going to show you how I change strings on the Pindles Bridge. And then if you were curious about how I did the audio in that playing section, I originally did it where each time I moved the bench, I moved the mic too, and I did my best to position it exactly the same height and angle and everything toward the guitar. But when I went back and listened to it, there, was, there were these really fairly striking room sound or maybe mic position sound differences that just it didn't, it didn't match up for me. So I went back and picked my favorite of those three and I re-recorded everything with each guitar in that same position. And then I, I dubbed it in over the video and I was using a metronome so it matched up. So that's how I did that. Um, okay, let's do Pinless Bridge and then we'll be done. Emerald introduced a standard pinless bridge with their new X20 model. And I'm a fan of pinless bridges because I think the fewer moving parts, the better. And there are no pins to go flying under the couch or break or lose or whatever. Um, it also, for strumming, there are certain techniques where you can put your palm right on the saddle. And you can't do that when the pins are there, and I kind of like that. But it does introduce a bit of a trick when it comes to restringing. I've heard people discussing this on the forums. <clears throat> One workaround is to just find a dowel and stick it in the hole after you place each string, and that's fine as long as you have that dowel, but it's kind of a specialized tool, and I've heard that um, bridge pins don't fit well in there. So if you don't have that, you're stuck. So I just use this technique. Um, one great thing about the side holes, you can reach right in and feel under the bridge. And so the trick to this is to understand that the ball goes all the way through the hole and all the way forward in the slot cut under the bridge here. And you want to make sure that it goes as far forward as it can go that way. And you can kind of hold it there and then raise tension on it with your right hand. So you do need to hold tension at this point with your right hand. And then the left hand can fish the other end of the string through the hole. And the whole time you're holding tension with the right hand so you don't lose your anchor position there. And then go in and kind of get your length about the distance from one peg to the next. And now come on back and notch it right there. Give it a twist around the tuning peg so it holds. Now at this point you're going to lose the tension here, unless you're more dexterous than I am. But that's okay, because now that you've got it anchored there, you can go back inside and find that spot again and um, get it knocked into place. So this is the hand technique that I use. Use your middle and ring fingers to pull up and keep tension here at the bridge. And take your first finger, see how I'm kind of hooking these in toward my palm? Take your first finger and pull it down, which will keep the string aligned in the slot along the neck. So this is the hand position I use. Now you can take one of these, the Ernie Ball Power Preg Pro, one of the best purchases I ever made. And you just, um, and as you start to get close, you can let one your ring finger go. And then as you get down, you can let your middle finger go. And there you go. Um, and then you can do one last check to make sure the ball end is where you wanted it. And that's it. You're good to go. So that's how I do it. I hope that's helpful. Okay, but what about the top strings, right? It does require a different technique. Um, so I've already measured off the string and made my bend. And so at this point, I'm going to reach back in, get the ball knocked into the slot, hold tension with my right hand, and then I'm going to use the left hand. I'm going to hold up with my thumb here and push down with my pinky on this side. And so now I can hold tensions on both sides and keep the string along the neck. And then, and this is a little less awkward when you're dealing with a table and not your lap, but you can do it on your lap. I'm going to reach over here. As it comes down, it gets awkward to use your thumb, so I switch over to my first finger. And the trick here is just to make sure you're paying attention to how much tension you're holding. The right amount of tension here so you don't lose your coil, the right amount of tension here so it doesn't fall out of the bridge spot. And there you go. Okay, and here we are at the very end. Uh, again, my goal is to make the video I would want if I were shopping for this guitar, so I hope it was valuable. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to put them down below, and thank you very much for watching.